Antonio Guterres has taken the reins as the United Nations Secretary General. The 67-year-old former Portuguese Prime Minister took over from Ban Ki-moon, who was in the job for 10 years. Guterres says he wants to stay in the role for five, and as Vanessa Kennedy reports, they could be some of the most challenging times the United Nations has ever faced. Antonio Guterres faces a world of challenges. He's described the conflict in Syria as a cancer on a global scale. And now, as UN Secretary General, he's going to have to help find a cure. As well as Syria, there's also a war in Yemen, an insurgency in Afghanistan, and UN peacekeepers are involved in 16 operations around the world. On this New Year's Day, I ask all of you to join me in making one shared New Year's resolution. Let us resolve to put peace first. Let us make 2017 a year in which we all, citizens, governments, leaders, strive to overcome our differences. From solidarity and compassion in our daily lives, to dialogue and respect across political di divides. From ceasefires on the battlefield, to compromise at the negotiating table to reach political solutions. Peace must be our goal and our guide. All it takes for the world to turn upside down is seven months. One by one, the mighty fell. Their ideas were rejected. Their plans burned. Their world view shattered. 2016 was a heck of a year. Speaking in an event for the 52nd anniversary of the establishment of the Fatah political party, Abbas noted that Palestine is willing to accept a Russian president's invitation for a trilateral meeting in Moscow aimed at reaching peace in the region. Now, Abbas expressed hope that the year 2017 will be, quote, the year of the independent Palestinian state. He also pointed out that Palestine would consider cooperating with U.S. President-elect Donald Trump to resolve ongoing crisis. Well, there may be something to celebrate about here in Israel. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump started the new year off by making it clear that 2017 is going to be a very good year for American-Israeli relations. Look, we have to protect Israel. Israel to me is very, very important. We have to protect Israel. As he was wrapping up his brief holiday comments, Trump surprised almost no one by stating his 2017 New Year's resolution is to make America great again. And he clearly believes that building even stronger ties between the United States and its strongest ally Israel is part of that plan. It seems that Trump wants to demonstrate his friendship with Israel on day one by inviting Prime Minister Netanyahu to his inauguration. According to sources in the Prime Minister's office, they have been contacted by the Trump staff, which is aggressively pursuing Netanyahu to attend the inauguration, and Netanyahu is considering the offer. According to the New York Post, Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, is leading the call to persuade Netanyahu to hold talks with Trump before the swearing-in. Уважаемые граждане России, дорогие друзья, 2016 год уходит. Он был непростым, но трудности, с которыми мы столкнулись, сплотили нас, побудили открыть огромные резервы наших возможностей для движения вперед. Главное, мы верим в себя, в свои силы, в свою страну. Мы работаем, работаем успешно. И у нас многое получается. Хотел бы искренне поблагодарить вас за победы и достижения, за понимание и доверие, за настоящую сердечную заботу о России. Счастья вам и здоровья, благополучия, с праздником, с новым 2017 годом.
An update tonight on the Russian hacking malware found in a Burlington Electric laptop. Rose Gomez talked with officials today. Over 20,000 Vermonters receive power from the Burlington Electric Department, and officials say none of their customers' data was compromised after a malicious malware was discovered on an employee's laptop. Something we take extremely seriously. Lunderville says that a company laptop was found with a type of malware that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has associated with Russian hackers. They immediately disconnected the laptop from their network and alerted authorities. Tonight, Donald Trump's ringing in the new year with new pushback. I know a lot about hacking, and hacking is a very hard thing to prove, so it could be somebody else. The president-elect at his New Year's Eve bash in Florida, still doubting U.S. intelligence and questioning if Russia Russia interfered in the election. Oh, I want them to be sure. I think it's unfair if they don't know. But 17 U.S. intelligence agencies concluded Russia was behind the hacking. Now Trump suggests there's more to it. I also know things that other people don't know, and so they cannot be sure of the situation. Trump will be briefed by leaders of the intelligence community next week and is promising more details. Like, like what, do you, what do you know that other people don't know? You'll find out on Tuesday or Wednesday. The top Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee tells our Jonathan Carl the evidence is ironclad. It's very solid. It's uh, indeed overwhelming. If he's going to have any credibility, as president, he needs to stop talking this way. President Obama has already retaliated, including closing two lavish Russian diplomatic retreats and evicting dozens of Russian diplomats from the U.S. That plane, now Moscow bound. I can't stress it enough. We're facing the real possibility of war against Russia in the next 20 days, you know, before Trump takes over. I don't want to scare anyone, but that's what's happening, unfolding in front of us. It's the leadership, whoever has the levers of power in the United States now, um, wants to confront Russia aggressively um, and uh, under threat of military force. The forces have been deployed for you know better than a year and a half to the borders of Russia, uh, from uh, the Balkans to uh, the Korean Peninsula, really. North Korea ringing in the new year with an ominous development in his annual New Year's speech. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un suggesting that the regime is in the final stages of testing an intercontinental ballistic missile on ICBM. Marking a potential breakthrough in Pyongyang's weapons program. Research and development of cutting-edge weapons has become active and the intercontinental rocket missile test fire preparation got to the final stages. Now, Kim did not explicitly say whether these tests were imminent, but he has a birth date on January 8th. Last year, Pyongyang conducted a nuclear test on January 6th. In 2016, the communist nation reportedly carried out nuclear tests while conducting up to 20 ballistic missile tests in that time period alone, setting an annual record. South Korea's unification ministry said in a statement that it, quote, strongly condemns Kim's threat to proceed with a test launch. It goes on to say the international community will not tolerate his efforts to develop nuclear weapons and threatens tougher sanctions and additional international pressures. Stern New Year warning to Hong Kong as the city gets ready to mark the 20th anniversary of its handover to Chinese rule in 2017. China will not allow anyone to use Hong Kong as a base for subversion against the mainland. Chinese leaders are increasingly worried about a small but assertive independence movement here where freedom of expression is protected by law. Over the weekend, thousands marched in the streets in support of four pro-democracy lawmakers facing a government-led judicial review to remove them from office. China's parliament recently made a rare interpretation of Hong Kong's mini-constitution, rebooting fears that Beijing is tightening its grip on Hong Kong's unique political process. Zhang's warning comes just as Beijing unleashes fresh fury over what it sees as U.S. President-elect Donald Trump's support of nearby Taiwan, which Beijing views as a breakaway province. Turkey started the new year on a somber note. An apparent lone wolf attack at a nightclub in Istanbul in the early hours of Sunday took at least 39 lives and wounded 69 others. This was the scene in Istanbul's popular upscale Reyna nightclub at midnight. The partiers dancing, waving sparklers, confetti flying as the new year is rung in. 
But just over an hour later, surveillance video captures this ominous scene just outside the club. Bullets ricocheting on the street, people running for cover. From the opposite angle, graphic video of a man dressed in black pointing his rifle. Authorities say the suspect killed a police officer and another person on the street before storming the club. The view from inside shows a gunman dressed in white, wearing a hood. Authorities believe the attacker changed his clothes. He stayed inside for seven terrifying minutes, shooting at the crowd that had gathered an estimated 600 people. Revelers reportedly jumped into the city's Bosphorus River next to the club, desperate to escape. In the chaos, the attacker slips away, and tonight is still on the run. Survivors crying, embracing each other, still dressed to celebrate. At least 39 people dead tonight, including more than two dozen foreigners, the club popular with tourists. Dozens more were injured, including at least one American. Americans warned by the consulate to shelter in place. The U.S. and Turkey are calling this a terrorist attack. So far, there's been no claim of responsibility, but tonight Turkish police sources tell us they do believe that the shooter showed signs of being a trained ISIS fighter. Meanwhile, Israel's anti-terrorism directorate has issued a travel advisory cautioning citizens against going to India right now. According to the statement, there is an immediate threat of attack to Western and other tourist targets, particularly in southwest India. The agency is stressing that a particular emphasis should be put on events in the coming days in connection with beach and club parties celebrating the new year at any locations where there's a high concentration of visitors. The South Asian country holds a strong appeal for many Israeli tourists. Israeli counter-terror experts are recommending that any visitors already in India avoid markets, festivals, and crowded shopping areas. They're also advising all Israeli families with relatives in India to immediately establish contact with their loved Loved ones and inform them of the threat. ISIS may have lost a lot of its income in 2016 thanks to coalition efforts to cripple its revenue streams. U.S. counterterrorism officials say ISIS is struggling to pay its fighters after airstrikes destroyed more than 1,200 ISIS oil tanker trucks over the past 15 months. But experts say ISIS can change how it makes money. Think of it as squeezing a balloon. Not hard enough to pop it, but hard enough to squeeze it. If you squeeze it here, it's going to expand someplace else. We have seen in the past, and we can expect to see now, they will expand into other directions. One of those directions is antiquities. ISIS already sells artifacts looted from areas it controls. It's released videos of buildings and statues being smashed, but other antiquities like coins and artwork can be sold on the black market for thousands of dollars. ISIS also makes hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue. Once it takes over a territory, it taxes residents on everything from crops to medicine to bank transactions. Even though ISIS is losing some of its revenue streams, that might not decrease its ability to carry out terrorist attacks because they're relatively inexpensive to finance. Revelations that Denmark's welfare system has been lining the pockets of jihadists fighting in Syria has led the Danish Employment Minister vying to take action over it. Denmark Security Service reported that 36 individuals apparently had left that country to join Islamic State in Syria. And despite being out of Denmark, they still received more than 90,000 euros and unemployment benefits, even though seven individuals were reportedly killed in action, their funding from Danish councils continued. Denmark isn't the first country either to discover its benefit system as being manipulated by terrorists. The UK found evidence its social welfare had funded the jihadists suspected of carrying out the terror attacks in Paris and also in Brussels. Well, as for the fallout in Denmark, we spoke to the leader of the Party of the Danes who says the problem goes far wider. What we are seeing right now is funding of terrorism. The, the state is funding terrorism and it is not only sponsoring uh, terrorism in, in Syria. Blood have been shed, uh, let alone last year, in the streets of Berlin, Brussels and Paris. And uh, a little more than a year ago, it also happened in Copenhagen with, uh, with terrorism. A portion of the Obama administration's regulations have been blocked in federal court, according to Red State. U.S. District Court Judge Reed O'Connor issued a preliminary injunction Saturday blocking the federal government from enforcing a regulation which forbids discriminating on the basis of gender identity and termination of pregnancy under Obamacare. O'Connor found that Obama administration's expanded definition of sex discrimination to include transgender individuals exceeds the Title IX grounds provided for in the Affordable Care Act. We must hold gun shops and gun runners accountable. Yes. And those who purchase the guns and sell them illegally yes. and accountable for the death and the destruction they are directly responsible for.
CBS Chicago reports hundreds of people marched on Saturday to Chicago's Michigan Avenue carrying crosses representing murder victims in the city. Those carrying them stretched for about a city block. They included both family members and strangers. The reading of each name was the only sound. The memorial was organized by Reverend Michael Flager, a Chicago priest. Flager said, until everybody in Chicago decides it's their problem, we're not going to end it. According to the Chicago Police Department, there were 762 murders, 3,550 shooting incidents, and 4,331 shooting victims in the year alone. Two protesters dropped into the Vikings-Bears game with a message for the stadium's owners. Using ropes and climbing harnesses, the two displayed a huge banner calling for U.S. Bank to divest and included a hashtag protesting the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. The project made headlines when activists camped out for months, blocking construction. The Standing Rock tribe argued the pipeline could contaminate their water. Construction is currently on hold while the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers looks for an alternative route. The Minnesota Vikings' home field is U.S. Bank Stadium. Energy Transfer Partners, the parent company of the pipeline, has a credit line of roughly $175 million with U.S. Bank. The climbers, identified as Sin Holiday and Carl Zimmerman, say they're protesting in solidarity with the self-described water protectors of Standing Rock. They dropped down early in the second quarter and, despite law enforcement attempts, stayed there until the end of the game. People in Hollywood woke up this morning to a sign that read, Hollyweed. The landmark hilltop sign that reads Hollywood was changed by some jokesters between late New Year's Eve or early New Year's Day. It appears that the Vandal Vandals of the iconic Hollywood Hill sign placed tarps over the O's to make them look like E's. Police are currently investigating it as a misdemeanor trespassing and plan to go over the security tapes to find the person or persons responsible. Although there is a cannabis co-op in Los Angeles that is named Hollyweed, it is unsure if they are involved with the incident. Korea is on alert after the avian influenza virus was found in cats. Twelve people believed to have had contact with the cats are currently under quarantine. They include the owner and veterinary lab staff involved in retrieving the infected animals. The group has been treated with antiviral drugs and will be monitored for any symptoms for 10 days. The virus was found in a house cat and a stray cat in Pochon, Gyeonggi-do province. It's the first case of mammals being infected with AI since a dog was reported to be infected with it in 2015. First of two baby bald eagles has been born. According to NBC News, the baby was hatched Saturday morning in Fort Myers, Florida. It could be observed on a live cam of the nest available to the public. The second baby is expected any day now. Fans have been following the antics of this particular bald eagle mother named Harriet since 2012. Since then, over 60 million people have tuned in to watch Harriet and her family. This is Harriet's second nest, this time with a new mate after the death of her former mate, Ozzy.